Now, in order to solve these challenges and make a product that actually works, um, the company has proposed two solutions. The first is to use computer vision techniques. Now, computer vision techniques are basically algorithms that allow computers to analyze, interpret, and make sense of digital images or videos. Um, so a really good example right here is um, from an autonomous car. So autonomous car obviously is using uh, camera technology. So it's basically taking, uh, taking video and it's constantly analyzing that content to figure out where things are and to take action accordingly. That's a great example of a computer vision technique. And generally, these computer vision, vision techniques that we see nowadays are going to fall under the branch of AI, or more specifically, I would say machine learning. There are two specific types of computer vision techniques that we're going to talk about. The first is called VSLAM, and the second is called pose estimation. Now, beyond just using uh, computer vision techniques, there are other tools that these, um, that these robots, that's proposed these robots would use. Uh, the second beyond uh, computer vision is the odometry center, or sensor, odometry sensor. Um, this provides information about the movement and position of robots by measuring the rotation of wheels. So particularly in an environment where there's no GPS, so there's no other external way to figure out the location of a robot, just by how many times the wheel has rope how many times the wheel has rotated, uh, an odometry sensor can detect how far the robot has gone from its initial position. And that's basically the role of the sensor. Now, instead of wheels, they may have treads, but these treads still have moving parts. And the role of an, of an odometry sensor would be to monitor their movement, the movement of any of those moving parts, and then use those to try to calculate uh, how far um, the robot has moved since its last known location and accordingly where that put the robot in the overall structure. And then furthermore, uh, the company proposes having a robot with a single camera. Now we'll talk about other scenarios later, but for now, let's just think, let's just play with this sort of scenario and look at this content through this lens. Now let's get into VSLAM, which composes the bulk of the content on the paper three case study. So when we're talking about VSLAM, we're really talking about SLAM, Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, with a camera. Now, SLAM is basically a method for estimating the position of an object and simultaneously constructing a map of an unknown environment. Now, in the context of rescue robots, what that means is that we're going to have a robot going through a building, and it's going to use its camera to not only map the environment around it to create a 3D digital map, but also to keep track of its own position while doing so. Now, the robot keeping track of its own position is the localization, and the robot creating the 3D map is obviously mapping. And right here, we have a good example of what a 3D map would look like. Now, that 3D map could be used for the robot to navigate around and rescue a human, or to provide information to a human crew outside the building so they can send their own rescue crew in to rescue that particular human. Now, again, when we're talking about VSLAM, we're, talk we're including the visual element, and that means we're working with a camera. And VSLAM is what we're really gonna be focusing on in this case study. SLAM by itself may be using other sensors or objects to do the same job. So in a nutshell, when we're talking about VSLAM, we're talking about tracking movement and mapping an area using a camera, in this case, affixed to a robot. Now, here's an example of when and how we would use VSLAM. So if we have a robot, like I guess a Roomba, without SLAM, it's kind of just going to go wherever it wants, and maybe there's some algorithm that dictates when it should stop, right? But with SLAM, the robot's actually going to use its own sensors. Um, if we had VSLAM, it would be using a camera to get an understanding of the room's layout and then strategically vacuum or clean that particular room. Now that being said, we are going to be using a camera in the context of our case study. That doesn't mean that we, that we might not use other sensors that also provide visual information or input. So besides cameras, we could be using radar, sonar, or acoustic, acoustic sensors uh, in conjunction with the camera. But one of the tools that is specifically mentioned in the case study is something called LIDAR, 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 or light detection and ranging. Now what LiDAR does is it actually uses lasers to create a 3D model of the environment or the surroundings of the particular robot. 
So what it does is it sends out laser pulses, and then it measures the amount of time required for light to be reflected back and return. What this does is the amount of time that takes for the laser to, to return after hitting an object dictates how far away that particular object is. So in a way, it's kind of like, I guess, sonar that bats use, except in this case, we're using light. And beyond just measuring the amount of time required to return, uh, this also allows us to see exactly where barriers are, right? Um, because if we're sending lasers, uh, if we're sending a laser and it takes a certain amount of time to return that dictates that the nearest barrier is 30 meters away, that means in between S and that particular barrier, we theoretically have uh, just empty space. So it allows us to not only uh, like figure out where the nearest object is, but also get an idea of the dimensions of our surroundings. Now, this is a little diagram of how LiDAR works. So basically right here, we have a laser source, which incidentally is probably the most expensive part of this particular component. And the laser source is emitting laser towards a mirror right here. And that mirror, and that mirror is reflecting that laser towards any possible objects or just in, maybe in some direction um, around the particular, around this device, right? And then once the laser hits an object, then it's going to reflect that laser back towards the mirror. And the mirror is going to reflect that laser down into a receiver. And then based on the difference between the time at which the laser is emitted from the laser source and is received by the receiver, we can then make a calculation for how far away uh, the object the, the object at which that laser was shot uh, is located. Now, another tool we can use is going to be an inertial uh, measurement unit, or an IMU for short. Now, an IMU is used more in the localization aspect of VSLAM. Our previous tool, LiDAR, could be said to be used more in the mapping, uh, in the mapping aspect of VSLAM because it basically allows us to figure out where and how far things are and create a digital model accordingly. So what the inertial measurement unit does is allows us to measure how far, in what direction, and in what orientation a robot has traveled. So in general, it's used for pinpointing the position of an object like a robot in a 3D space in order to accomplish this task. It measures acceleration, rotation, and magnetic field of the particular robot using an accelerometer, which detects changes in velocity. Remember, velocity incorporates speed and direction, uh, and additionally using a gyroscope. Now, a gyroscope provides information about an object's orientation. You might wonder why we need to know what the orientation of the object is. This could be important if you have a robot moving through a, a building that's undergone a lot of damage. Um, it might be moving up an incline, uh, down an incline or over some wreckage. And thusly, it's not just going to be um, on a flat horizontal floor. And this information might be important for a rescue team, but also would be useful in allowing us to make sense of the visual data that we're getting, right? Because then if we see like a sort of slanted image of a wall and we can see it, we can look at our data from our gyroscope, we understand that the reason that image is slanted is because the robot was moving up an incline. And furthermore, this is actually an optional component of an IMU. We may use a magnet magnetometer um, in order for us to get an idea of magnetic field orientation. And that's basically a compass. So we can use that to get a sense of what direction uh, geographically a robot is moving in through an indoor space like a building. So basically, this sensor, or this device called an IMU, combines these three sensors into one tiny device like this or like this in order for us to measure uh, the, the speed, the rotation, and the direction in which a robot is moving, and possibly use these also to figure out exactly where the position is of a robot based on how fast and what direction it is moved in in a given amount of time. Now here's an example of an IMU. So right here we have, in this IMU, we have a gyroscope that's operating on the X, Y, and Z axes, then an accelerometer that's operating on the same axes as well. We don't have a magnetometer, as I said, that's not necessarily a prerequisite for an IMU, but obviously it has its uses. Now, a crucial process in which I, the IMU is used, as well as the odometry sensor, which we went over earlier, which if you remember, allows us to use the rotation of wheels or any other moving part to measure the distance a robot has moved, is dead reckoning. Now, to give you an idea of what dead reckoning is, I'm going to 
kind of draw a little example right here. So let's say that we have a building that we know to be roughly 500 meters wide and 700 meters long. Now we are deploying the robot from the entrance, which is right here. We know nothing else about the building. The building is presumably on fire or has been destroyed, and we've never seen the building before, but the robot needs to be able to keep track of exactly where it is in that building. Now, the robot, using its odometry sensor and IMU, is going to move. And we know from its current position that, based on these measurements, it has moved 30 meters at a 20 degree angle. Now, based on our knowledge of the dimensions of this particular building and our data from our IMU um, odometry sensor, we can basically approximate what the position of the robot is in the building. Now, that is dead reckoning. Dead reckoning is calculating the current position based on the previous position and the movement from that position. So the potentially the speed uh, and the angle um, of our movement from the previous position and also for how long we moved or just the distance as measured by the odometry sensor. Now, some other applications for this may be at sea, most commonly, where we, we might measure our current position with GPS, and then based on dead reckoning, we could estimate where, we could estimate where we are after a certain amount of time. Um, actually, I guess not at sea because we'd have GPS, but probably land navigation or orienting, orienteering is a better example, where you're in the, where you're in the forest, you know your current location, then based on how far you walk and in what direction, you can estimate where your next location is. Now, velocity and acceleration of movement, as I said before, are key, velocity being speed and direction. Now, our estimation of the current point, so this we could say that this right here is our previous point, and this right here is our current point after movement. This, our purple arrow right here, is going to be an example of dead reckoning data. So any of those estimates that we make based um, on how far we think we've moved and, at and in what direction is going to be dead reckoning data. Now, unfortunately, after we've done this a few times, we may not exactly be where we think we are. So every time we take one of these measurements, it's not going to be completely accurate. I mean, measuring the rotation of wheels isn't always the most accurate um, like measurement, really. We're, we might be off. And we might be off by even like maybe 0 0.001 meters or something like that. But the point is, we're not going to have an exact estimation each time. And as we move through the building, so as we make an estimation to get to this point, and then we make another estimation to get to this point, then we make we get make another estimation to get to this point in the building, our error from each of those estimations using dead reckoning is going to build up. Now, this cumulative error that builds up is what we refer to as the drift problem. So after a while, the error gets bigger and bigger and bigger, where to the point where we might think that this right here is our current location, when in reality, we're actually somewhere here. And that's why it's important to use secondary or external sensors around the building or GPS to ascertain our true position as often as we can in order to mitigate the effect of this cumulative error of this drift problem. So earlier I said, unfortunately, because dead reckoning is actually pretty cool, we could be completely in, completely in the dark and not know where anything is. And based on the movement, based on our movement, assuming we're a robot, or based on the movement of the robot, we can localize that robot and figure out where it is. But because of the drift problem, we are still going to need some external help in consistently getting accurate uh, localization or getting an accurate position for where we are in the building. Now, it doesn't diminish the value. So probably up until even, even this point right here, or even this point, we might not be so far off, but at some point we are gonna need some external updates in order to mitigate the effects of the drift problem. Now here's another example of the drift problem, but this is in the air. So right here, we know that the airplane has traveled uh, at a certain speed um, in a certain direction. So if the airplane starts right here, then based on our dead reckoning, we know that it should be here. But in reality, because of wind, because of an unforeseen factor, we're actually right here. And that's kind of a very, I guess, primitive example of the drift problem. Like, so right here at this point, we would need to use GPS or something like that in order to actually ascertain exactly where we are.
Now that we've discussed some of the tools and methods used to conduct vSLAM, let's actually talk about the process itself. What we're gonna look at now is four steps that are taken by a robot with a camera every time it moves. And these steps are done in order for it to not only determine its own location, but also to make sense of the environment around it in terms of a 3D map. Let's start with the first step. Now, the first step is at its particular location, at the robot's particular location, to capture any images and or sensor data. Now, the kind of sensor data we might be capturing might be using a device like radar. So we're just going to capture, we're just going to have the, the camera look around and capture any images at the particular point in which the robot is at. Once it's, done, once it's captured those images, then what the robot is going to do using vSLAM is to identify and isolate key points and regions of interest in the sensor data. By that, we mean points that are relevant to helping the camera actually map uh, the particular area it's in, as well as generate, as well as to be able to navigate. So some examples include corners, edges, landmarks, uh, etc. Now these can all be considered key points. Features like corners are very important because they signify where the robot would have to turn. And also, for example, in a building, they might signify that there is a hallway and then there's another hallway on the other side that can be navigated. Edges could be used to distinguish door frames or windows. And the list kind of goes on. These are just two specific examples. But all of these important features are known as key points. And as soon as an image is taken, the robot is going to look at those images to try to detect any of those key points that exist. And not only does this help create a map, but it also helps the robot figure out, exact, figure, out, figure out exactly where it is and how far or where it has moved to. Now at that point, the robot is going to engage in a process called data association. So it's identified features in a particular frame and now it's going to look back at all the other frames, by frames I mean frames of video, that the camera has captured, and see if it's seen that particular feature before. So that may be a door, that may be something in a kitchen, that may be any relevant key point, but it's going to look back and see and try to figure out whether it's seen that feature from another angle or from simply another point in order to be able to use that data to get a better idea of where it's located and in doing so, build a 3D map. Because for example, let's say that we have a door right here, okay? Now, if the robot sees it, this is our little robot, and it sees it from this point, and it sees it from this point, and it sees it from this point, using the perspectives from all three of these points in different frames at different times, the robot is going to be able to better distinguish the size of that particular door frame and exactly where it's located. And again, this helps not only mapping, but also allowing the robot to figure where it is in relation to the objects and features around it. Now, at that point, the camera is going to update its pose and its map. By pose in this particular case, we mean the position orientation of the camera. It's basically where it is and which direction the camera is pointed in. And obviously by map, we mean the 3D map that we are seeking to construct through this entire process. And this is an iterative process. So every time the camera captures a frame, these four steps are going to be taking place until the entire building has been matched or the rescue team or the team managing the, managing, managing the robot from outside the site is satisfied with the map that has been built. Now in all of this, let's take some time to talk about the hardware setup. So obviously we've got the camera right here and any other sensors. When we capture that data, that's going to the front end. And by the front end, we really just mean the robot. At the robot is where tracking and data association is going to be done. Tracking is referring to tracking any key points or features. And data association, remember, it was that process where we look for those same features in previous frames. So this is happening at the front end, at the robot. Now, for more hardcore processing, we're going to send data from the robot to the back end. Now, that may be a base station or a server that is located outside the rescue, rescue site. And we're going to do multiple things. 
Um, we might do something called pose estimation, which we'll talk about a little later on. And also optimization. Optimization is going to be taking all the data that's been collected so far and then analyzing to build a more accurate map. And once we've done all of that processing on the front and back end, we should end up with a valid 3D map that represents the VSLAM estimate. Now we just talked about the VSLAM process, but for some reason, the writers of this case study have decided to present the VSLAM algorithm as well. It's not really a decision I understand because of the fact that in all the academic papers I've looked at, there hasn't really been a distinction between the two. But for your reference, and because of the fact that you're going to have to answer the questions by the case study, you should know that the VSLAM process approximately captures these two right here. So in the algorithm, we have a number of modules, and these are all different steps, or rather more like functionality as part of the algorithm. Before we even get started with the algorithm, we start by initializing our robot with some known global coordinates that indicate the location of the robot. That way the robot knows where it's starting and from there can make accurate estimates of, like regarding its position. Once we've done that, the next module, module one, is going to be real-time camera and post tracking. Then we're going to have local mapping and then loop closure. As I said, we're going to look at all of these modules, including two other modules that aren't in this particular diagram. And the first two will match the VSLAM process most closely. Let's look at those in more detail now. So this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of VSLAM and the VSLAM algorithm. One thing I do want to clarify is that the VSLAM algorithm doesn't just represent the process that's going on in the camera at the uh, at the robot, but also both this front end and back end process or processing that we've talked about. So we're not only just gathering and then immediately analyzing frames of data, but the VSLAM algorithm also incorporates uh, the functionality that allows us to take a look at all the data we've captured and optimize it and make sense of it so that we have the most 3D map possible. So in the algorithm, we not only have the granular, the granular frame analysis, but we also have algorithms that look at, or functionality rather, I guess modules in this context, that look at the map as a whole and make sure it's as accurate as possible using all the data available. So I would say that's the main difference between the process and the VSLAM algorithm. The VSLAM process only really covers two modules of the VSLAM algorithm. And the VSLAM algorithm not only focuses on analyzing data that's been immediately collected, as it's done in the VSLAM process, but it also goes one step further and looks at all the data that's been collected holistically to create the most accurate map possible. That being said, let's look at some of the steps in the VSAM algorithm. Now, the first step is the tracking of visual features, which we've talked about before. And this is the tracking of visual features across frames for, pur for purposes of localization. So keeping track of the same feature, and by feature we mean, a vis we mean like, again, like a door frame, a window, anything distinctive. So keeping track of those across multiple frames in order, to, in order to be able to make sure the robot knows exactly where it is. So for purposes of localization. Now the next is the usage of the VSLAM process for the purpose of building a 3D map. So we have tracking, which is essentially localization. And then we have local, local mapping, which is the mapping aspect itself. Now beyond those two modules, we have the third module, which is loop closure. Now in loop closure, we are basically focusing on instances where the camera revisits a location that it's seen before. So maybe a robot rolled through an old kitchen in one frame, and then 10 minutes later, it rolled back through that kitchen. Now loop closure is going to detect both of those frames, and then make sure that, they are, that the data collected from them is consistent with each other. So it's going to look at both of those, and based on the data from both frames, it's going to generate or alter the existing 3D map. This is used to improve the accuracy and consistency of a map. Consistency being really important because consistency means that all the frames that have been captured agree with each other in terms of the, in terms of the 3D map. So for example, if one frame says that this door is three meters wide, then the other frame should agree with it. And if not, some changes need to be made. And furthermore, 
uh, loop closure can be used to improve the estimation of the robot's position because we're basically getting a better, better idea of the dimensions of the different features in the 3D map. And if we have a better map, then it's easier to estimate the robot's position accurately and mitigate drift. So again, these are all modules. So they're essentially pieces of functionality in the VSLAM algorithm. They, I would say that these would be executed in this order. It would make the most sense to me. But now we're gonna look at two further, two further modules that may or may not be executed. Well, one, well, let's get to it actually. So these modules address the situation in which the robot might get lost. I call these supplemental modules because the robot may not get lost, but anyways, the fourth module we could say, or the first supplemental module is called relocalization. And this is the process of reestablishing a camera's position and orientation, which translates to the robot's position and orientation because the robot is connected to the camera in a known environment and it involves feature matching. So the robot is going to look around for features that it's already seen before and try to mat and try to figure out where it is based on the distance and angle between the, the camera and those features. And then also pose estimation. And pose estimation involves the camera angle. So the point is we're using visual elements around us, assuming we're robots. So the robot is using, is using visual elements around it to find, find its position again in the case that it's gotten lost. And the next module is global map optimization. Now, this has functionality that both involves helping the robot find itself again, but also uh, allowing the, the full, I guess, improvement of the map or the holistic improvement of the map. So global map optimization, we are looking at the entirety of the map and the entirety of the frames that have been collected the map. So all that data, we're making sure that all those frames agree with each other. This has a lot to do with the consistency that we talked about before. So we're enforcing the visual consistency. We're making sure that with all the data we have, the map that has been generated is completely accurate. And this is done to, so in the case in which the robot's lost, this basically means that the robot will have a more accurate map to work with. Now, the difference between global map optimization and loop closure, as we talked about earlier, is the fact that loop closure is really doing this on a frame by frame basis. It's more granular versus with global map optimization, we're not just looking at one feature or one visual or scene. So not just one part of the building as loop closure may be doing, but we're looking at the entirety of the map and all the frames that have been collected. Now, as part of global optimization, there are a few processes that take place and we're going to look at those in more depth. Now, these are bundle adjustment and keyframe selection. And again, the role of these is to is to use algorithms to analyze the various features and, and visual data, and then use that to improve the overall accuracy and detail of the map. Now, the first map optimization is bundle adjustment. Bundle adjustment takes a number of characteristics or number of features into account, and it uses those in order to give us a more accurate uh, 3D map. Let's, let's look at this in more detail now. So basically for bundle adjustment, bundle adjustment is by and large an algorithm. And we're gonna have three pieces of input data. We're gonna have the camera position, not post. We're going to have the camera calibration characteristics. So focal length, different characteristics of the camera itself that's on the robot. We're going to have 3D points describing a scene. So the 3D points that we've already kind of come up with based on what the robot has seen and then 2D frames of the scene from different angles. Now, let me go into this process in more detail. Let's say that we have, hmm, what would we find in a burning, destroyed building? Okay, let's say that we have a, t a television set that's sitting in the middle of a room in a destroyed building. It's pretty small, but basically, at some point in time, this is going to have to be part of our 3D map, okay? So in bundle adjustment, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the different perspectives from which the robot has seen this. So we can assume the robot has seen it from, has driven by it, has seen it from this perspective, 
from this perspective right here and from this perspective right here, okay? Now, based on these perspectives that it's seen it from, we're going to have a frame for each one of those perspectives. So now let's look at, let's just draw some frames right here. So this is instead going to be an image of the, of the, t of the TV. This is going to be an, one image and this is going to be another image. Now, from this image right here, we want to look at this particular point on the TV. So I'm going to circle that in green. Okay. So we want to find the, that point on the TV in this image right here. So right, we can say right here on this frame where the robot captured an image of the TV, this, this green dot is the point that corresponds to the blue dot on the TV. Similarly, right here, this green dot corresponds to the blue dot on the TV. Similarly, right here in this image, this corresponds to the blue dot on the TV. Now these all represent the, like basically where, where that point on the TV is as taken from the frames. However, that might not be completely accurate. And we also want to, rec we also want to reconcile all of those particular points on the different frames. So what we do is we go to this 3D point right here. Remember right here, all of these, like these green points are 2D points on a, they're 2D points on a particular frame. The blue point is a 3D point that all of these 2D points are basically pointing to. So what we're going to do is at this 3D point, we are going to take the camera's position from each of these frames into account as well as the camera calibration ca characteristics. So the, basically like what the, what the specs of the camera are. And using those, as well as using information like the distance from which it was taken, which is also the camera position, we're going to use those characteristics to project our own 3D point back. So we're gonna use those characteristics to extrapolate where we think that that 3D point should actually be on each of these frames. So the green, like the green points are where, we, where we've seen them on each of these frames. And then the blue dots are where we think they should be based on the 3D point and based on the specs and the position of the camera. And basically these shouldn't be different, right? In general, they should be the same thing. And if they are, nothing's gonna change. But if they are different, then we're going to have something called reprojection error. And reprojection error is going to be the difference between the point on the 2D frames and the point that has been projected back. So that purple distance represents the reprojection error. Now what bundle adjustment is going to do is do this calculation for every single 3D point in the 3D map, which understandably is going to take a lot of computing resources. Now, I mean, this process represents a particular disc discrepancy between the frames and between where they should be based on the characteristics of the camera. Now, once we've found this reprojection error for each of the, for all of the 3D points in our particular map, and this is all gonna be based on different frames, different visual features, then what we're gonna do is we are going to generate a function called a cost function. Now, what this cost function does is it takes the factors that we talked about earlier. So the camera pose, camera characteristics, 3D points, and the 2D points on the, the relevant frames. It takes those as input, actually as vectors, and then it outputs the estimated reprojection error. So we get all the characteristics from the video and about the camera, and our output is the reprojection error. Once we've done that, we use something called an optimization algorithm to basically figure out how much we need to adjust the 3D points so that reprojection error is minimized. So we want to minimize the difference between the projected point and the point on the individual frames and our optimization algorithm does that. Now, once we've figured out how much these 3D points have to change to minimize that reprojection error, then we're gonna make that change. And in doing so, we should get a more accurate 3D map. Now that in a nutshell is bundle adjustment. Uh, we've got another diagram right here. 
So again, we have a 3D soccer ball. And we're looking at this from four different poses or camera positions, as we can say. Now, each of these poses have are, are, are looking at a specific point. I mean, really, they're going to be looking at all the points in the soccer ball. But they're looking at a specific point on the soccer ball, which I believe is actually right here. I'm going to draw a red circle. And so that corresponds to the different frames. Now, the 3D model is the projection back. Um, so where, based on the camera data, the information on the camera, its calibration characteristics and its position, that's, that's going to give us the point where we think that that soccer ball should be on the particular image. So it could be something like that. Basically, it's going to be intersecting the image. So we're going to, we're going to have two points. We're going to have, as we said, our image in a frame. I guess this doesn't really make that much sense right here because, I mean, it's on a soccer ball and it, it's maybe not, not as logical. But the point that I want to make is that we are discerning the difference between what the camera saw um, from multiple angles and then what perhaps it should have seen based, based on the information that we've been given. Now, the next method we can use for um, global map optimization is something called keyframe selection. Now, this is a very different method from, bun from um, bundle optimization, or sorry, bundle adjustment. I always get that confused. Um, now, rather than looking at every single 3D point, um, for every, I mean, basically the map is going to be divided into a bunch of different scenes or visual features. And we're going to look at all the frames for those visual features. And we're going to pick a subset. So we're going to pick only a small group of those frames that best represents that particular 3D place in a building. Again, referred to as a scene or a feature. Now we're going to choose this subset of frames. We're going to choose this group of representative frames or images based on their, their quality, their visual quality, uh, collectively how much of the scene they cover, uh, motion diversity. So basically what do they cover, like what's the, together what angles do they cover that scene from? Is there a sufficient diversity of angles from which they're covering that scene? And then temporal spacing, meaning do the frames that we've selected cover this particular scene at a different time? And temporal spacing can be really important because Obviously, if we're in a building that's burning or any number of things are happening, a scene is going to change, can change very quickly. So it's important that we have frames that capture a particular scene at different times in order to make sure that our model is taking any changes that have occurred into consideration. Now, once we've taken the subset of scenes that meet our criteria um, and are essentially algorithmically chosen, we're going to use those to design a 3D model. And what we can do using keyframe selection is actually reduce our computational load because we're going to be using a smaller collection of frames in order to generate our model. So this means fewer frames we need to analyze in depth in order to make our model. Now, this is an example of keyframes or keyframe usage, not necessarily in the context of vSLAM, but in the context of surveillance video. So, you know, surveillance videos are obviously going to be 24 hours long. And in the case of a crime, probably nothing would have happened for like 23.999 of those hours. So through keyframe selection, we could select frames where maybe some motion has taken place or frames according to some criteria. And those can be representative of the surveillance video so that we have the most relevant uh, frames, or most relevant data really from a surveillance video. And by doing so, we don't need to watch like 24 hours of the video. Now we're going to quickly go through the differences between bundle adjustment and keyframe select, uh, selection. And obviously the purpose is similar, but done in a different way. Um, the inputs are different. We have a variety of inputs for bundle adjustment as we went over before. Um, and keyframe selection only really looking at a subset of frames. Um, for the iterative process, so each time the bundle adjustment is trying to update the 3D points and also the camera poses, so uh, the camera's position. We didn't really talk too much about that. I, I kind of wanted to focus on 3D points, but essentially we're updating the position of the camera and the 3D points to minimize reprojection error, while each time the keyframe selection process is going to be selecting new frames based on criteria. Um, 
we kind of talked about the considered uh, views. Now that really corresponds very heavily to the input. I think the biggest difference between bundle adjustment and keyframe selection is the computational load. So obviously computational load for bundle adjustment is going to be very heavy because we're looking at all the frames and we're doing some very intensive analysis, uh, graphical analysis, you know, taking 3D points, 2D points in those frames in order to optimize this map. Uh, versus keyframe selection, our algorithm is mainly focusing on selecting sl um, frames that we think are representative and then really doing the more hardcore analysis in order to build our 3D frame using those particular, to build our 3D structure rather, uh, using those particular frames. Now for our next slide, we're almost done with VSLAM. What we want to look at in this particular chart is the advantages and disadvantages of VSLAM. I'm going to spend some time with this because as you know, the IB loves advantage and disadvantage questions. Now some of the advantages are real-time operation. So we can collect and analyze data in real time in order to give us an accurate view or portrayal of a 3D structure. Uh, we have scalability. So there's really no limit as to the size of the environment that a VSLAM enabled robot could handle. So we could have multiple robots or in reality, we could just have one robot spending a lot of time analyzing and building a 3D map for one particular structure. Uh, the low cost, so assuming our robots aren't terribly expensive, really, we just need a camera to perform VSLAM. Those LIDAR sensors or devices and INU devices we talked about are cool, but not specifically necessary. Um, and finally, adaptability to various platforms. So in the context of this case study, we're talking about rescue robots. And I think for some reason, I get the feeling the assumption was like wheeled rescue robots. But really, we could adapt these to maritime, to aerial drones. We could really put this on anything that's moving in order to perform VSLAM analysis. Now, some of the disadvantages are the inherent visual challenges. So we're not going to have good lighting conditions. We're going to have occlusions, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, they're dynamic objects, so there's things constantly moving around. And generally, when we're going into an environment, there's a lack of accurate geometric information. So distances, where things are located. And these can all be challenges in terms of generating an accurate 3D map that to an extent can be mitigated by our optimization algorithms, but not always. Uh, computational demands. So VSLAM is very computationally intensive, particularly since it's performing so many operations in real time, which means both on the front end and the back end, we need to have the computing resources to enable VSLAM. Uh, drift and accumulation of errors is another disadvantage, which we talked about earlier. And finally, initialization. So before VSLAM can really get started, we need to allow the system to collect, to just basically walk around, not walk around, roll around, and collect some visual data. So there is some basis by which the, uh, the robot can start building a 3D map. And before we go on, I want to go over the term occlusions because this is going to be very relevant quite soon. Now, occlusions are a situation in which the object that we're trying to assess is partially or completely obstructed by an, another object we don't really care about. Like in this particular frame, I think we care about the woman's face. And assuming that we care about the woman's face, the Scientific American magazine can be considered an occlusion because it's covering up her face. Now, finally, I want to get into the topic of more cameras. This was a scenario that was put forward in the case study. So I want to talk about some of the pros and cons and really considerations surrounding affixing more cameras to a robot. Now, obviously, the pros are we have additional viewpoints. So we can view the same scene simultaneously from different angles. So more through coverage of scenes. We have redundancy so that if one, if one camera breaks, then we can simply use data from other cameras. And we may have better feature matching or tracking, partly as a result of the additional viewpoints, even with occlusions. So if you can see a particular scene, a particular visual feature, a particular key point from multiple angles at the same time, it allows us to better deal with any objects in the way, basically like occlusions. Now, some of the cons are obviously more data, more computing power. Additionally, we have something called a synchronization problem, which will come up later on. 
um, again, which is the fact that when we have multiple feeds of data, we need to make sure that they're in sync with each other. So we need to make sure that when we collect that data, that all of the frames, like for example, if there is a frame uh, 20 seconds in, we need to make sure that the frame 20 seconds in uh, is arriving at the same time for all of the cameras so that we can collectively get uh, an image from all of them at the same time. Because if we get a frame for 20 seconds and 21 seconds and 22 seconds, we just have a bunch of cameras doing different things. And this can be really complicated to sort out and get a full picture at a particular point in time uh, of a 3D feature. Finally, we have a hardware cost. So beyond just the cost of, mo of more computers, we're also going to need more computing power and this costs money. So those are some of the considerations for using more cameras with VSLAM. The next topic in the case study is pose estimation. Now, we talked about pose estimation in a very different way in the previous section when we were referring to the position of the camera. Here, we're going to be talking more about the position of human beings and their body parts. Now, broadly, pose estimation is another computer vision technique that allows us to estimate the position orientation of an object or a human relative to the camera in the real world. So basically what we're doing is we're identifying, locating, and tracking key points. We didn't go into so much detail into what key points are in the previous section, but to be very clear, key points are important points or visual features in an image. So if we're talking about humans, some key points may be the shoulder, uh, let me just use a different color, so the shoulder, the elbow, um, obviously their torso right here, uh, clearly their head. Those are examples of key points. Now obviously key points are going to vary based on the context, but in this section we're going to be dealing, dealing primarily with human beings because we want to be able to track and identify human beings in a rescue situation. Now we have some models to determine key points. And by models, I mean that these are essentially functions or programs into which we can put an image and we can receive key points as output. The first we have is the rigid pose estimation model. Now this is used to identify key points on inanimate objects and could be used in a building, for example. Uh, some examples would be corners, edges, etc. Beyond just navigating a building, I suppose if you were looking at something like a TV, like in one of our examples, then rigid pose estimation would be useful in sort of figuring out what the dimensions of that object are. The second model, model we're going to talk about is going to be human pose estimation. Now, human pose estimation is used to identify key points on animate objects. So animate objects could be animals as well, but again, given the context of the case study, we're going to focus on human beings. And we're going to be largely working, on, working with or discussing human pose estimation models from here on out. So again, these models accept images as input and output the, the location of key points as grid coordinates. Now, when working with pose estimation in the context of human beings, we're going to have a series of key points that are oftentimes connected to each other. Now, each connection or each, key, each set of key points that are connected to each other can be referred to as a pair. So for example, right here in this example, from here, right here in a, at the end of the hand to the elbow, could be referred to as a pair of key points. Now, generally, when we're working with key points, we are going to take a 2D image of key points and pairs and transform it into a 3D image to predict the position of a person and their body parts. Now, it could be a 2D point, or even, in some cases, a series of 2D points. That kind of shows how this goes hand in hand with the VSLAM process. There is a clear connection between these two in how uh, the human pose is, is basically analyzed. However, let's assume, given the figure or the diagram that's in this particular case study, that we're just working with a single 2D image like this one right here. 
Now what's happening is that 2D image is being fed into a model, a human pose estimation model. And from that model, we are getting multiple, we're basically getting a multiple key points that are connected together. And that's this particular image right here. So we're basically getting an approximation of the human form as dictated by key points. Using that 2D image, we can then extrapolate a 3D figure. And that 3D figure can come in handy if we're, if we're using a robot to physically remove a person from a particular structure. Now, there are two more specific human pose estimation methods that we're going to talk about. Those are the bottom-up and top-down methods. So to give you an idea of what both of these are, we're going to start with the bottom-up approach. So what the bottom-up approach does is it takes an image and it analyzes it to find key points. That's this particular frame right here, the input image being the original image. From those key points, now when it looks at those key points, it doesn't really think about how many people they are, who they are, anything like that. There's no real context taken into account. Key points are put in, are taken in, or, or key points are basically analyzed and located based on their location relative to each other and in what configuration they are, and they're plotted on the image. Then those key points can be connected to each other in order to represent the human beings that are in the image, the human being or human beings. So basically we're starting with key points. We're starting with important points like the elbow, the head, the torso. And then using all those points and their locations, we are build, we're basically building them up into, into human forms. Now the top-down approach does something that is opposite. You're inputting an image, but the top-down approach looks for full human looks for full human forms first, like so. So right here, we're just trying to figure out what the, like how many humans there are, how many full humans there are. Versus in bottom up, we're just looking for individual key points, regardless of who they correspond to, or whether they correspond to a human or not. Although they would correspond to a human. Once we've figured out how many humans there are, then we kind of drill into those human forms and we figure out what body parts there are. And then in those body parts, we look for any key points. So basically with bottom up, we're starting with key points and working our way up to a human form. With top down, we are starting with a human form and working our way down to key points. And all of this is to be able to detect uh, the, how many and basically humans there are in an image and what the configuration of their body is. So what their pose is. Now, some of the advantages are if we're working with individual key points, rather than looking for a full human form, it makes it easier to handle occlusions because occlusions could, could kind of throw off our desire, our effort to find a full human form. It also makes it easier to detect a variable, no, variable number of people. So if we're in a crowd, if you focus on key points, so essentially key, not necessarily body parts, but key points in the body, we can get a better, more accurate approximation of how many people there are in the crowd and the key points that correspond to each individual portion, person rather. Furthermore, when we have complex pose configurations, bottom-up comes in handy because we're not making any assumptions about where the key points would necessarily be. We're just finding any prospective key points and then putting them together into some sort of configuration based on how they relate to each other. Some of the disadvantages are increased computational complexity because we're trying to find so many key points and associate them with each other across multiple images. And that kind of, I just really want to emphasize again that like right here when we talked about th this particular process of going from 2D to 3D estimations. Again, it's weird because in the case study, it's only referring to one particular image. Particularly with finding a 3D pose, I do think that we would be looking at multiple frames in order to get a full approximation of the 3D pose. Anyways, that leads to increased computational complexity. Also, we need to make sure that we're really good at detecting key points and our model is awesome. Because if it's not very accurate, then the entire thing falls apart. So we're pretty much dependent on the ability of our model to effectively detect key points. Now looking at top-down, to look at the process in more detail, basically we're detecting the whole human form. And then based on that human form, 
we are going to look for body parts. And then based on the locations of those body parts, we're gonna look down even further for key points. So we're localizing key points based on where they are in the human form. We're using the known location of these key points in conjunction with other factors we went over before, distance between key points, relative positions to each other, anatomical information to build a pose estimation. I wanna emphasize the point of all of this is to figure out where the humans are and in what configuration they're in. So where their body, how they're like, where the body parts are basically. That sounds super, super gruesome, but like if you think about someone being trapped under a rock, like their knee may be broken, I guess maybe, okay, their arm might be broken. It might be like backwards or something. And then their leg might be somewhere else. Or you never know, right? And that's the point of the bottom up and the top down approach. Now the top down approach, we had the advantage of leveraging prior information on body position. So we can take some context and we can take some input to help us find those body forms. Uh, moreover, we can get accurate localization. Now this isn't really saying much, but besides the fact that top-down works. So we can find key points. Um, some of the disadvantages are sensitivity to occlusions and complex poses. We talked about this earlier. If, we're, if our first step is to detect a human form, then, and there's something kind of blocking that, and it's gonna be a lot harder for us to detect that form. Versus with key points, we're starting with individual parts of the body and then working our way up. So we don't worry as much about occlusions or complex poses for that matter. Um, we need to have a good human detection model. Um, if we don't have that, obviously, then you know it's gonna be quite difficult. And partly because we're trying to detect uh, human forms and we're not starting with individual points, it can be really hard to sort of distinguish people in a crowd because all of their images are like quite close together and we may not necessarily see human forms. Now, this looks kind of terrible, but still readable. Um, so I want to I basically um, compare top down and bottom up. Now with top down, we can handle a varying number of people, um, but we're going to struggle with crowds or overlapping individuals. Bottom up is much better at that. Uh, Bottom-up is going to be more computational demanding because of the fact that we need to take all these key points and associate them with each other across multiple frames, which is something that we're not necessarily doing with top-down. So we are trying to find human forms, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're associating a bunch of different points across uh, multiple frames. And next, top-down can be more sensitive to occlusion and complex poses, mainly because we're not starting with points and then working our way up. Now, one of, the, one of the scenarios or one of the questions that was asked in the case study was about increased accuracy in human pose estimation. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of trying to be more accurate in detecting humans and their configuration in a rescue site? Now, obviously, if we have higher accurate accuracy in human pose estimation, we can find images or we can find the, the location of victims more quickly and with more precision. Um, we can more easily navigate to them based on that better localization. And also, we can interact with our human victims. So a human victim might be raising their hand to signal either their status or uh, something about their position. And if we have increased human pose uh, estimation or increased accuracy, we can, better, we can better detect that that is like a hand that's moving and then make sense of that interaction, or at least alert a, uh, a human viewer or human operator on the other side of the crash site or outside the crash site that that interaction is taking place. And moreover, we can get better assessment of the physical condition of the victim, mainly because we have a better idea of how their body is configured and what it's supposed to look like or what it looks like. Now that comes with trade-offs. A more, um, I would say, rigorous analysis of a human pose requires more computational complexity. So we're going to need more computing power in order to more accurately analyze a, uh, a human pose. There's increased sensitivity to noise. So if we're looking at a human pose, pose more granularly, so if we're looking at more details, it also means that things like occlusions or any other factors that mess up our image could have a higher impact. And more time is required to train models as well. So we need more inputs and more time to train our models to accurately be able to identify key points with the requisite, requisite level of accuracy.
Now, the next thing I want to talk about is communication. So obviously there isn't a communication section in the case study, but the robot needs to be able to communicate either with other robots or with a base station, with the rescue team, somehow. And this two-way communication link is actually mentioned in the case study with very little specificity. So we're going to talk a little bit about how robots can communicate, communicate with each other. And then we're going to talk about something called edge computing, which is a unique way for robots to interact with each other and a base station. By base station, I do mean a human on a computer outside of the rescue site. Now, there are a few options for robots to communicate. One is wireless networks, so simply Wi-Fi. This obviously has certain issues, including uh, being including the fact that it may be difficult to communicate through objects or a large building or at distance, but it is what it is. Another option that's quite intriguing is mesh networks. Now with mesh networks, each robot functions as a peer in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So if a robot wants to send a message back to a centralized server or to another robot, it passes it to one robot and then to another robot and then to another robot. So let's imagine that we have an operator that's sitting outside of a site. And we've got some robots all the way over here. Uh, this robot right here, this one right here, detected uh, some sort of nuclear incident or like radioactive waste. and wants to communicate that. What it's going to do is it's going to send a signal to this robot, which will send a signal to this robot, which will send a signal to this robot, and then that'll send back to the base station. Versus if we were talking about Wi-Fi, then it would literally just get on the Wi-Fi network and perhaps transmit that to a router, but then back to the operator. Now, other options include satellite communication. Starlink is a great example of that. If you don't know what Starlink is, it comes from Elon Musk, and it is a low orbit satellite constellation. Uh, you can communicate with it by buying a really small receiver. Uh, you can buy it online. I think it's like 300 bucks or something like that. And pretty much anywhere, any country where Starlink is available, you can just get internet. Um, it's been used a lot in the, uh, in, the, in the Ukrainian or the war in Ukraine. And it's also been used for disaster reliefs, relief in other parts of the world. Uh, one of the great things about it is you just need a small power source and you can immediately get on the internet. Now that's an option, although I would argue that if we were able to access Starlink, then we'd probably also have other technologies that we apparently don't necessarily have in this context, like GPS. Uh, another option is long range radio. Um, that could have some issues potentially with the amount of energy required and the distance by which we can communicate. Um, again, this one I'm, I'm not too sure about, to be honest, but it's a valid option. I think you're more likely to run into mesh networks or wireless networks as a way of communication, but just keep in mind that long range radio is an option. And finally, we have a physical cord. Now this may seem kind of primitive, but actually I did see a video the other day of some crews using robots to detect survivors in Turkey uh, where the earthquake happened. And they literally just had a physical cord connected to a robot. And they, then they sent the robot into the building. Now, some of the benefits of that are obviously the fact that that could be a power source by itself. And then also you don't really need to worry about line, not being able to have a line of sight communication. I think one of the some of the problems with long range radio and wireless networks was the fact that is the fact that when you're out of sight uh, of the base station, so you're out of sight of the operator, like this guy right here, um, and you, well, yeah, okay, so you're, if you're out of sight, and there's also barriers between you and the operator, then it can often be difficult to communicate, and your signal may not get through. And physical cords are a pretty obvious solution to that. However, I would argue that probably one of the downsides of physical cords is the fact that if it gets caught in something in the building, you pretty much have to send a human in there anyways, which is which kind of defeats the point of sending a robot in. So physical cords are cool, but they obviously have very real physical limitations. So now let's talk about edge computing, which represents another paradigm for communication between robots and their operators or a computer outside the rescue site. Now with edge computing, this is a little bit different than what we've talked about before. 
So if you remember our initial diagram, we talked about certain processes taking place at the robot and at the base station. Well, in edge computing, the, lar the large majority of that, including global map optimization, would theoretically take place at the robot or among a group of robots. So we're going to have things like tracking, uh, loop closure, and then also global uh, map optimization, which is a pretty heavy duty process taking place at the robot. Now, this is called edge computing because in this paradigm, this processing is taking place at the edge of the network close to data generation. Data generation in this context being the cameras that are affixed to our robots. In order to aid in the additional processing that needs to take place, we may attach something called an edge device, which is a small low power computer to handle the additional processing load. This would have another processor and then also some memory in order to basically conduct this more, I guess this more um, heavy processing load, which I think I've repeated like five times by this point. So we have edge computing, they're at the, the robots are at the edge of the network and they may, they may be affixed with edge devices. Now, there are a couple of different ways to talk about edge computing. What we just mentioned was an edge device, also known as an edge server being affixed to a robot. An alternative would also be to have our robots communicate with multiple edge servers in or around a rescue site. Now, that might be cost prohibitive and inefficient if we're just rescuing someone in a small building, but if we're working in a place like, I don't know, Chernobyl, for example, then it might actually make sense to have multiple edge servers that all communicate, that all work together and that communicate with one larger centralized server in the cloud or somewhere, I guess, outside of Chernobyl that's not radioactive. Not that all of Chernobyl is radioactive. If you haven't been, you should really go sometime. Now, some of the advantages of edge computing are reduced latency, or really, I like to say that this is faster decision-making time. If robots are doing all the processing, including global map optimization on their own, then they don't need to wait for a response from a distant server with, more, with a more accurate 3D map or further information, so they can act more quickly. There's also enhanced data privacy because sensitive data, such as that uh, taken from human pose estimation, can be done exclusively on a robot and not sent off to a centralized server or a server that may be in the cloud even. There's offline capability. We don't need to connect to the internet via Starlink, or we don't need to connect to another network even using something like Wi-Fi in order to be able to conduct the full vSLAM process. And this can be really useful, particularly in a situation where a robot is deep underground or deep within a building somewhere and just can't communicate. Basically, the robot can operate all on its own. Uh, scalability. We need less processing power at the central server, and the load is distributed among edge devices. So there could be a situation where robots can kind of work with each other to process and share data, and can also synchronize actions with each other. And this means that a large number of devices can quickly work together to accomplish a task. Now, some of the disadvantages are limited processing power and storage. Even with an edge device affixed to a robot, we're never going to have as much processing power as like a large computer, a large supercomputer, or a server farm located, at, located outside the rescue site. There's also the complexity of managing a distributed network. We have all these different nodes in a network and managing them, making sure that uh, all of these nodes can function effectively on the same network and communicate with each other can be quite difficult from a technical standpoint. Uh, finally, we're, we're sending these robots in with these edge devices. And while the robot may be conditioned to work in an environment that is very hot or that is very austere, the edge devices may not be equipped for that. So we need to make sure that, that those edge devices are hardened to be able to deal with the kind of environments that these rescue robots are going to be going, going into. And finally, like everything, we have the cost of the edge infrastructure. That goes without saying. Earlier, we were talking about different ways to use vSLAM. Um, this may not be using vSLAM, but this is a cool example of an aerial drone that's using an edge device. And it has a camera, so presumably it's doing something important or cool. Now, what we're going to look at is the further research section. 
And this is somewhat speculative, but I did look at the keywords in the further research section and expand on those. Now, the first concept that's covered in the research section is sensor fusion. Now, sensor fusion is kind of, it's kind of giving a name to something we've already talked about. Basically what it means is that we're combining information from multiple sensors to get a better understanding of our environment. So let's say that we're taking, we're in a building, the building's on fire, uh, it's radioactive, um, also like, I guess there's like smallpox, aerial smallpox, smallpox that's being transmitted. So we're sending in a robot with thermal sensors, gas sensors, um, also at LIDARs and IMU, and cameras. What we can do is for each frame that the camera takes, we can also use our other sensors to take a reading of the radioactivity, of the biologicals, and of the uh, gas breakdown in a particular area. So each frame could be matched up with data from other sensors. And then human re a human rescue team can look at this and try to decide what equipment they need to be able to survive in different parts of the building. That's a great example of sensor fusion. This data from sensors can be also incorporated into a 3D map. So on a 3D map, we could see what areas are safe and what areas are not for a human rescue team. Now, some of the challenges are cost, sensors are expensive, computational demands. To process all this additional data, we're gonna need more memory, more processing power. Uh, the complexity of integrating data from multiple sensors. So this goes back to the synchronization issue that we mentioned uh, when we were talking about multiple cameras. And that's making sure that the sensor data is, so we're taking sensor data in at the same rate as we're taking camera data in. So for example, sensor data might uh, take a reading every 10 milliseconds, or the camera might take a frame every one millisecond. But we need to make sure that the sensor data for each frame it, like the sensor data for those 10 milliseconds matches each of the 10 frames in that time. And that can be a complex task from a technical perspective. Also different data formats from the sensors. And we pretty much just talked about synchronization. Now, in the case study, the term sensor fusion model is specifically mentioned. This is an example of a sensor fusion model that applies to a self-driving car. We have long range radar, uh, short range radar, um, LIDAR, and we have some sort of, I don't know what vision means. I guess maybe we just have a camera. We also have a thermal imager, GPS, speedometer, accelerometer, etc. And all of this is going into a processor or a computer, including the map, and V2X, which is presumably something that allows you to see around corners. And all of that is coming together to allow the self-driving car to make a decision on where to go next and how fast. That's a great example of sensor fusion. Now right here it just says sensor fusion, but this may be a processor or computer of some sort. Now the next concept we're gonna talk about is rescue robot swarms. Now with rescue robot swarms, there's not a lot of explicit detail given about this besides the fact that some algorithms might be used. What we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about some of the considerations that would need to be taken into account and where algorithms may need to be used in order for rescue robot swarms to be enabled. Now we're not gonna talk about specific algorithms because honestly, I just feel like that would be really pedantic and that's just like way too detailed, but we'll give it a shot. Now the first thing is gonna be movement control. So we're gonna want these all of these uh, different like rescue robots to be moving in the right direction, right? To the right place. They need to have an agenda. Um, the next is going to be coll collision avoidance. So while multiple robots are moving around, they need to not run into each other. There are algorithms for that, and that needs to be taken into account. So just like where these rescue robots move, and then them not running into each other by themselves would require the use of sensors and algorithms. Moreover, these robots would need to be able to communicate with each other and strategize. So they need to be able to work together in order to take advantage of the fact that they're a group. And that kind of relates to optimization which we have down here. So they need to communicate their locations and organize a plan so they can maximize coverage of a given area, potentially minimize energy consumption, and potentially also minimize bandwidth usage. So communicate with each other as little as possible. And the algorithms to allow robots to be able to do this 
those are all going to need those are all going to come into play. You may also want adaptive algorithms to allow the swarm of robots to react to real-time data. So to be able to take real-time data, analyze it, and turn it into decisions, not just for individual robots, but for the entire swarm. And finally, we need to be able to deal with fault tolerance and redundancy. So what actions will take place? How will the robot swarm compensate if one robot is lost? Or two robots are lost, or I don't know, like the entire network is lost except for one. So rescue robot swarms are a possibility, and these are the condition these are the considerations, what needs to be taken into account, particularly from an algorithmic perspective. Now finally we have the concept of intelligent network infrastructure. Now intelligent network infrastructure is a very broad term, but it basically involves AI allowing the network to basically facilitate a changing number and type of devices on the network. So it's basically allowing the AI to control the network and allow it to adapt to different things that are going on. And it's not just AI, but also just automa automation techniques. So some characteristics of, an, of intelligent network infrastructure are the fact they scale it, they excel at scalability. So one robot could drop off, another, dro another robot connected to an intelligent network could drop in. Basically, we can connect and disconnect at will. Also, virtualization can be used to spin up new networking resources to maintain the organization of the network. So you might spin up a virtual router or a virtual switch, not necessarily because that those are like those are the physical resources that are needed, but because that helps maintain network organization communication between different branches of the network. We're going to have real-time analytics so we know what's going on in the network in real time and the network can adapt. AI and machine learning facilitate security. Uh, intelligent traffic management, which kind of goes back to virtualization of resources. Basically, we can organize the network so that traffic fl flows as efficiently as possible. We maximize our network resources. And then dynamic detection and response to network issues. So if something goes wrong with the, net with the network, there's an automated solution to deal with that. Now, we've covered nearly all of the content that is required for the paper three case study. But what I want to do in order to tie all of this together is to present to you a real world scenario and then discuss it and discuss how all the concepts you've learned about could be applied to this scenario. So your mission is to create a swarm of autonomous rescue robots to rescue survivors of Russian missile strikes in Eastern Ukraine. The hired bot robot, but bot robot kind of sucked. So it's your mission. Now, we all know the Russians like to blow up large civilian apartment buildings in urban areas. So what we need to do is develop robots to be able to rescue people when that happens. Now, the caveat is that your robots may be deployed in active urban battlegrounds. So think rockets, mortars, artillery going off while your robots are trying to rescue people, which is actually a very real scenario right now. So they need to be able to adapt to dynamic circumstances. Now you need to decide what is the ideal profile of a rescue robot in the situation, considering communications, algorithms, devices, and any other network paradigms. And for now, you can assume that cost is not a factor. We'll talk about cost later, but assume that you have all the money you need. So first, I think we can say that VSLAM is probably a pretty good decision. This is because the fact that VSLAM can operate in real time and is basically purpose-built for this particular scenario. It can quickly build a model of a dynamically changing building and then use that model to be able to navigate and conduct other tasks. So we're gonna use VSLAM. Now bundle adjustment versus keyframe selection. I think with this one, there are obviously trade-offs between both of them, but I think I would go with keyframe selection. One, because it has a lower computing load. And I think this is probably pretty important because of the fact that even if computing load wasn't an issue, if you had the most robust robots in the world, we can assume that these robots are going to be operating for long periods of time, and they're going to be conducting vSLAM over and over and over again. So I would say that just for the longevity of these devices and just given the volume of data that they're going to have to hold, 
probably keyframe selection is a better option, just given the scope of the task. Now, in terms of estimation models, I think that I would probably go with uh, bottom-up HPE, because particularly if this robot is working in an, urban, in an urban battleground, there's going to be, it's going to have to detect multiple soldiers moving around. And moreover, a lot of these apartment buildings have people and have lots of people in them. They have families, they have groups of people. And I think that by being able to build up models using individual key points, it would be a lot more successful in, this, in these types of scenarios. Now for communication, I would probably favor using the mesh networking if, if these robots were to communicate with a base station. And it could be mesh networking in conjunction with a Starlink base system, or potentially even Starlink could be used on each of these robots, although that'd be really, really expensive, even if cost isn't a factor. But I would prefer to use mesh networking because a lot of these buildings that are being blown up, one are huge, have multiple floors, multiple layers, and have extensive underground networks or have an extent have extensive basements. And I think in that particular scenario, there's not really any other solution besides net mesh networking that would be useful. Um, and I think mesh networking also makes sense as well because we're working with a swarm of rescue robots. So if you have a swarm, we're going to have other robots to act as nodes in this mesh network. Sensor fusion is gonna be a must, I think, particularly if you have the money for it because particularly if there's things like artillery raining down, there's going to be fires. And these fires may create an environment in which a human rescue team might need gas masks or might need respirators in order to function. Um, the people in those buildings might already be dead, but still to remove the remains, these, this rescue team would probably have to operate in a compromised environment. And in order to get all the data to allow them to effectively do that, I think sensor fusion would be a great decision. And finally, edge architecture. Now, I think that edge architecture is a really crucial choice because of the fact that edge architecture allows these, allows these robots to operate without a central base station or even like a, an operator far away. Now, in an urban battleground, that like whatever centralized server we're using or centralized uh, computer or operator that the robots are communicate, communicating with is just as likely to get blown up as the robots. So if all the robots are tied to one centralized server and depend on that server, that, lo that server in the area in order to function, then like if that gets blown up, then they can't do anything anymore. They're basically useless. So basically in order to allow robots to make decisions on their own, I think implementing an edge architecture with a robust edge device is really, really crucial. Now, finally, the level of autonomy. Now, this is, I mean, this could be up, I mean, this is obviously a very contentious point. I would say that in terms of robots being able to make decisions and rescue survivors on their own, they should be subject to, they should be able to analyze any gestures or any input from human survivors. And they should be able to be controlled by a human, uh, a human rescue team if necessary. But I think we should actually give these robots a fairly high level of autonomy. Because again, like if a rescue team has been blown up by a mortar or something, right? We still want these robots to be able to function in this kind of environment. And honestly, they're more likely to survive than humans are. So just because humans aren't there to make, the deci make decisions or give input, we don't want people to die who may be trapped inside or underneath buildings. So I think in this particular environment where we may not have a choice, high level autonomy is a must. Now, that being said, if costs were a factor, I think it's worth like looking at how this would change our decision calculus. So if costs were a factor, I would probably say that, I mean, perhaps sensor fusion wouldn't, ne wouldn't be necessary. We could kind of get rid of that one. Uh, if we had a camera that and we could access that in real time, then that might be sufficient to gauge whether a particular area is safe to go into or not. Um, mesh networking, I don't think is particularly expensive. I know it's been used to provide internet, internet access in remote parts of rural Africa, which is not a high cost of living location. Uh, moreover, these, this is not necessarily going to be affected. This isn't gonna really play into cost that much. And keyframe selection um, is, 
takes less computing power, so it would be lower cost anyways. Now, edge architecture, even with cost taken into consideration, like I think that edge architecture should be really important. Again, not in all rescue contexts, but in this one, just because like you want these robots to, these robots can't depend on anybody, right? And they can't even necessarily operate on each other because probably half those robots are gonna get taken out by, by an artillery shell at some point. So what edge architecture does is it gives them the, the ability to operate on their own, to make decisions on their own. And I think that even given cost limitations, having some sort of functionality in that respect would be really important. Again, in such a compromised environment, I think that probably an autonomous robot is better than a human team that may or may not ever get there. So that being said, like some of the social and ethical considerations that you'll come up, that will not come up against, but you'll see in the exam are, are robots expendable? Um, I think that probably this case, that this uh, real world scenario you, you went over is a great lens by which to look at these social and ethical considerations. So are robots expendable? I think they are. And I think that in any one of these scenarios, we're gonna be using robots because a human won't die in place of a robot. So basically what I mean is that instead of a human dying, a ro maybe a robot gets destroyed. And I think that's acceptable. Moreover, robots can survive in environments that humans can't. Um, another question might be utility versus cost. So that's something we talked about here with um, what if costs were a factor. This is not something, this really depends on the context of the question. In some of the practice papers that I write, I will probably pose that sort of ethical scenario because it kind of makes sense. And there's also a technical aspect to that. So what technical abilities could we give the robot while still making the cost low enough that it's affordable for those who need it? Uh, what if robots accidentally har harm humans is another social and ethical consideration. Again, it depends on the context. I think that if there are other options and if humans can go into the rescue site or be adjacent in order to prevent a robot from autonomously rescuing a human and then accidentally hurting the human, that'd be preferable. But it's all going to be trade-offs, right? Like, okay, a robot might accidentally harm a human, but another human might die to rescue that human. So... We're gonna to have to make this decision based on the context. In the Ukraine scenario, again, with such a kinetic environment, it's probably a risk worth taking, right? Uh, emotional value of, ro of robot rescue versus a human rescue. Again, this is something that I think probably depends on every human, probably depends on the society you're in. Like perhaps Japan, where people are used to working ha side by side with humans, at least older people, I guess, would be a better place from an emotional perspective for the use of rescue robots than somewhere somewhere like rural India, for example, where robotics is not robotics aren't heavily used. And finally, the use of AI and autonomy and rescue robots. This is actually like this is a great topic. And honestly, like all these topics should be discussed in your classroom because this is an awesome one to talk about. Again, we went over this in the Ukraine scenario, but I think it really depends like on how available humans can be to make decisions in places of robots. And that's really something that you're gonna to have to take into consideration based on the context of the question. Now, that kind of covers everything in the case study. To wrap up, what I wanted to mention was some additional vectors for research because ultimately the case study is not just about what's in the case study, but also topics that are related to what's in the case study. And I think that some useful vectors for research would be reading up on situations where rescue robots have been used. Now with bot robot, there wasn't a clear, there wasn't even that clear of a context really given, but I think looking at real world scenarios would help you understand some of the challenges involved with utilizing the technologies we talked about in this case study, and also getting a better understanding of the ethics and the social and ethical implications of rescue robots. Um, reading up on the ethics behind autonomous robots would be another great idea. What have great thinkers, what have people in this space said about the ethics of using autonomous robots, particularly in a rescue scenario? And then some further reading and analysis on drone swarms and how they work. Perhaps some more well-known algorithms might be a good addition. Now, again, as I said in the beginning, 
Uh, I'll link the cram guide and practice papers in the description. And in that cram guide as well, I'm going to include some links for this additional research that we talked about. However, I would really encourage you, if you have the time, to just kind of get on Google and just kind of explore this topic in more de depth, because I think that there's no real substitute for chasing your own curiosity. However, if this is the night before the exam, then just follow those links and that should help you out. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this and found value in this video. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to the channel and consider buying the Cram Guide to support this channel and to support yourself. Have a nice day.